So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to introduce the moderator uh, for this panel, who is uh, my friend Jame Cascio, who's right here. So Jame is a, a well-known and well-written futurist uh, in the uh, he lives here in the Bay Area. He started uh, uh, many years ago in the futurism space and uh, gained a lot of notoriety in the early 90s with the uh, uh, with the website World Changing. Uh, early 2000s. Early, I'm sorry, early 2000s <laughs> with, uh, with World Changing. Um, right. he, he's since uh, proliferated his thinking in a number of spaces, uh, both through his current blog, which is Open the Future, uh, and he also is a, you know, a senior thought leader at a number of places, including the Institute for the Future uh, and the Center for Responsible Nanotechnology. So today he's going to play on the panel the role of responsible nanotechnologist moderator, <laughs> I think. And uh, later this evening, he'll be closing up more with the Institute for the Futuristic Perspective, I think. So I'll turn it over to Jame, and he'll introduce uh, his panelists. Hi, folks. Uh, thank you for, for showing up. I trust that uh, your blood sugar levels are properly pumped, and I will try not to put you to sleep in the, in the post-lunch haze. Um, so as, as Jonah said, I am with the, the Center for Responsible Nanotechnology as one of my, my myriad functions. I, I sometimes describe myself as an easily distracted generalist, and uh, this is the perfect kind of work for someone like me. I am not a technical specialist, but I am someone who can speak the technical language um, well enough to fool people. Uh, what I'm here to do is, both in this, in this panel, but especially this evening, is to not just translate the technical, the technical ideas for a non-technical audience, which is more of my traditional role, but to help translate the non-technical concepts for a, an audience that tends to be more focused on the technology. Um, technology, whether we're talking about AI or robotics or semantic webs or nanotechnology, does not exist in a vacuum. And it's critical that we recognize the context in which all of, this, all of these developments occur. And I know, well, I hope, and in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that our panelists today are going to be happy to talk more broadly than just simply what the latest, you know, what the la latest fiddly bits are in uh, the nanotech space. Um, the, the original uh, panel moderator was called away to a, due to a family emergency, so I'm stepping in. Um, so what I'd like folks to do on the panel here, what I'd like you to do is to introduce yourself Tell us a little bit about what you're working on, and to describe over the course of, say, five minutes, five, ten minutes, what you think are the, the biggest near-term and longer-term challenges for the emergence of, of nanotech. And one of the things we'll do is when we come back around is to play a little bit in the space of what really do we mean when we talk about nanotechnology. So, Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Chris Anzalone. I am president and CEO of Arrowhead Research Corporation. Uh, we are a publicly traded uh, nanotechnology holding company, uh, and our model is to actively build nanotech companies um, uh, and then to centralize a lot of the, the key management responsibilities at the level of the parent. Uh, we think it's a much more efficient way to run companies, um, and, and we believe that it will allow us to, to accelerate the development. Uh, we have six subsidiaries right now um, in energy, healthcare, and electronics. So I don't know how to address that question. It's a very broad question. Um, Good. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I would, I would, I guess I would think of those challenges uh, uh, in three parts: uh, uh, research or science, uh, commercialization, and then exit, exit of companies. Um, and the challenges are fairly clear in all of those. I think, I think particularly right now, uh, for for the science component, it is it is always science funding um, now uh, more than ever. Um, you know, the private sector cannot afford to do basic research, and so it is, it is, uh, it is a proper uh, partnership between the federal government, state government, and, uh, and, and private industry uh, for the governments to, to fund basic research. Uh, it's a very difficult time for basic research funding, and I don't see that getting better anytime soon. Um, you know, as, as this budget deficit continues to, uh, to grow, I just can't imagine that the, uh, that the, uh, the research community is, is as strong a lobby as, as others. So, so that's going to suffer, and that's going to have long-term effects 
um, you know, this next, you know, the, the next cadre of, of paradigm shifting technologies are going to be a little bit more dispersed, a little bit, a little bit farther out than otherwise. Um, but those are the realities, and so I think that we have to, we have to, to uh, take a look at the way that we develop basic science and, and, uh, and react to that, to those, to those realities, and not just complain about them. But you're going to hear a lot of complaining about them over the next few years. That's that is for sure. Uh, so I guess the, I guess the the next component will be commercialization. The challenges with commercialization are what they have always been for nanotechnology, which is uh, which is scale up and cost. Um, you know, nanotechnology is really good at doing neat things at the level of the lab, at the level of one or two or three devices. Um, but the challenge uh, to, uh, to bring these world changing devices Uh, and that may that may sound trivial, but it's not because because companies, I think, good companies are really are really built uh, around uh, their perceptions of how they're going to get liquid, how they're going to exit. Is it going to be IPO or, or, or acquisition? So so I think companies are going to change their their strategy a bit, their models a bit, um, and those acquisitions are going to be no picnic in the near term because because uh, you know those acquiring companies are, are hoarding their cash as well. Um, now, the good news is this is all going to be a blip in the long term, in the long run. There's, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a recession or a depression. I don't know how long it's going to last, but it, but it will work its way out, and, uh, and the credit markets will, will, will uh, start to move again, and, and uh, the markets will get back to normal at some point. Um, so, so five years out, ten years out, I don't know that this downturn, this economic downturn is going to make uh, a huge long-term difference other than, I guess, as I mentioned, uh, how it affects uh, the scientific funding, the basic research funding. Uh, and that's probably five minutes worth, so. Okay, thank you. Christine, you're up. Okay. In terms of near-term challenges, we could spend the whole panel probably talking about the current economic situation, and maybe we'll come back to that in the Q&A. But I'm just going to pass over that because that's, it's such a, such a depressing topic. Um, but if you want to talk about it, we will. Um, in terms of... Chris, wait, could you actually introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Uh, Christine Peterson. I'm with Foresight Nanotech Institute. We've been around for quite a while. And uh, we're a nonprofit uh, attempting to maximize the benefits and minimize the downsides of nanotechnology. So I want to direct your attention to a particular sector that I think is, is really exciting and we should pay close attention to, which is nanosensors. You may, if you, if you watch nanotechnology, you may have seen the phrase, this is going to be the decade of the sensor. That's very possible. Um, the, the number of ways these sensors are improving all at one time is, is uh, stunning in terms of obviously the size, the weight, the power requirements, sensitivity the specificity of the sensors and the cost. These things are all making excellent progress. Um, and why, why do sensors matter so much? They're, they're used across the board. You can't, I don't think you can probably name an industry that doesn't, uh, doesn't need or couldn't benefit from, from better sensors, whether it's transportation, um, anything involving safety, medicine, robotics, um, you name it, uh, sensors are important. Um, Nano wires and nanotubes are very important uh, for detecting chemicals and biological substances. Uh, and one, the most exciting area to me right now is cancer applications because both in detecting cancer, even on the breath, imagine if you could detect cancer, early stage cancer just through a breath detector. Um, that's, it's coming, it's definitely coming. And they're also using nanotechnology materials to, um, to image cancer and then actually to destroy the tumors. And some of these, these ways of destroying cancer are very elegant. The technical 
people in the audience, if we had time to go into it, you would say, wow, that's elegant. That is really cool. Um, if you're interested in a tutorial, you can get a very nice one in Sensors Magazine um, from David Nagel and Sharon Smith. There's also a new book called Nanotechnology Enabled Sensors for the technical ones in the audience. Two companies to keep an eye on that I, I've been watching these for years just because they're so cool. Uh, Nanomics up in Emeryville, they have the memorable URL um, nano.com. Can't forget that one. Um, they, uh, it's a nanotube based technology. They use, um, they're targeting medical applications. Um, the other fun one to watch is Owlstone Nanotech. They have a dime sized detector for under $5. You, when you look at their site, you can see, all right, they're targeting security applications. This is what their thing is. But the fact is these things can have tremendous um, applications. These are, this is just more of a marketing thing. These things can be used all over the place. So what, why is foresight tracking this? Well, it turns out that um, although I'm extremely excited about these things, especially for environmental applications, um, imagine if we could stop taxing good things like income and sales and instead tax pollution. You know, when you, when you tax something, you get less of it, right? So why are we taxing the good things? Can't we turn it around and detect and t tax the bad things? Um, you can. With good enough technology, you could do that. So anybody who's into the environment should be turned on by these things. Unfortunately, what's the downside? Um, well, sensors, just like um, electronic monitoring, can be abused. Um, there are real privacy and civil liberty concerns. And uh, even if those concerns don't distress you, you should, uh, you should still pay attention because it will delay the technology. If you look at how RFID rolled, it was, uh, hit some bumps in terms of these kinds of issues. Um, and of course, um, to the extent that our concerns about electronic voting are based on real problems, I mean, that's, this, these technologies can be slowed down, they can be derailed uh, if people have concerns. Uh, and, and not just in the U.S. If you look overseas, look at China, some of you, I'm amazed how little, little publicity uh, the Chinese abuse of the Skype technology has been. Um, there's some very serious issues with Skype technology in China. So technologies are abused, it delays their deployment. Um, what's our suggestion? Well, we want some open standards. We, uh, the phrase we're using, and you can pick these up from me or out front, is open source sensing or open source physical security. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that with anyone who's interested. If you have time, join us at Convergence. The, these flyers are coming here over from the, from the theater. This is November 15th and 16th over at the Computer History Museum where we'll be exploring nanotechnology and other technologies as well as open source sensing in great depth. I think that's it. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Tony Waits with uh, Quantum Insight. We're a consulting firm and we focus on uh, uh, helping commercialize early stage emerging technologies like nano and microtech. So I, I, I've been doing this for, I don't know, six or seven years and work with a really wide variety of companies from Chevron with the Nano Diamonds, um, you know, a, a sensor company out of UC Berkeley, uh, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And more recently in the last year, I've been working in the area of uh, um, simulation, simulation of nanostructures, particularly the electrical characteristics. I was working with, a, with a one Danish company and now I'm kind of working with that company's successor. Um, and so in that role I've been, you know, talking to uh, people who are uh, uh, making electrical devices, so talking to a lot of emerging memory makers and, and also the big, the big chip companies and so forth. So, so my thoughts on, on, on nano and kind of what will happen with uh, commercialization of nano is essentially, um, I, I guess, you know, nano became kind of a hot buzzword, um, I don't know, around 2000 or so. You know, had, you know, the concept has been around for a long time, ever since, you know, Feynman made his uh, famous uh, uh, quote at, at dinner in 1959. 59, okay. So, you know, and, and it's, it's clearly steadily progressing, but there was kind of a, a, a hype bubble of excitement. And a lot of the people who jumped in on the nano bandwagon are now kind of moved to the clean tech bandwagon. I've, I've you know, I've, I met with VCs, not, not this VC, but I met with VCs. I said, weren't you a nano VC? I said, oh, that was last year. Now we're a clean tech VC. I, I think this has happened quite a bit. Nano conferences have become clean tech conferences. So, you know, and we, you, you, everybody knows that, right? Fashions come and go, so that, that happened. But, you know, 
emerging small tech is, it progresses either way. So, you know, when it was fashionable, it just meant there was a lot more money coming to it, and now there's just not that money, but it will still progress. Um, so that's kind of my, my big perspective, right? This is that we're, we're, we're still on the curve, it's just that, you know, it's kind of, you know, the hype around it is gone. Which is good, you know, there, there's, there's some benefits to that too. But, you know, the downside, of course, is just, is the funding, right? If, if the hype is gone, you lose money. So you lose the you know, ability to, to raise new money. So if you look at what's, what's fashionable these days with venture capitalists, it's uh, Web 2.0 um, and clean tech. And so if you look at a Web 2.0, actually, I, yesterday I had lunch with a friend of mine um, who works at LinkedIn. This guy is an undergraduate physics at MIT and went to Stanford grad school, got a PhD in physics in quantum computing and quantum dots, right? You think he's a, a dyed-in-the-wool nano guy. And, and now he's at a, a social networking company doing um, statistics, you know, statistics of, their, of their various data. So we were talking about you know, a company like LinkedIn versus a company like uh, D-Wave, which we have an investor in D-Wave here who can tell us more about, which is a quantum computing company. Um, D-Wave, I, I couldn't find any uh, numbers on D-Wave in terms of how much money they've raised, but LinkedIn has raised over $100 million. And this is just to implement a website, you know, where, which is basically a front end to a database where people can enter information and link to other people. I looked at another similar kind of company, Constant Contact. I've been using them. It's a great email uh, engine. Um, it works really well. Those guys raised $130 million. That's a, that's a lot of money just, right, essentially for a website that sends out emails. It works really well. So um, if you look at these kinds of things, you think, how much money does it take to, to implement a, a company? Well, these Web 2.0 companies, you can put in $100 million, and you can have something which sells you know, directly to uh, consumers and, and, and has a good, you know, good, good future and good revenue, I guess is the... Whereas, you know, um, things, that's purely a software thing. If you look more towards kind of a hardware-ish thing, you know, Silicon Valley, obviously there were lots of, lots of chip companies in Silicon Valley. A friend of mine, a Silicon Valley veteran, actually a, a co-founder of, of a test semiconductor, uh, gave me a shocking figure last week, which was that there's no, there's been no uh, new uh, chip company founded since Oct uh, November of 07. Um, um, so no fabulous chip companies. And uh, I actually have a friend who's trying to do a fabulous chip company right now, and, and he, uh, he tells me that the VCs don't want to talk to him at all. So it just shows you, you know, something which is kind of a, uh, more physics related than, you know, a LinkedIn or a constant contact. Um, they're not getting any traction. And the reason is people believe it takes a, like on the order of $150 million just to design an ASIC chip, which is a lot of money. So why am I bringing this up? Well, you, you know, something like LinkedIn is purely software. A chip company is, is more, you know, more physics oriented. Obviously, a lot of nanotech things are, are very heavily in the physics oriented realm. So, so the idea of taking something which, where you're starting with, you know, raw physics and trying to go up all the way to an end product is pretty scary for many applications. And so a lot of companies, what they want to do, um, like, again, some of your portfolio companies in the area of memory, um, people don't think they're going to make a new memory company. They think, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come up with a new memory technology and then license it. But then, it, but the, the problem with that is that many VCs find the licensing model less appealing because you're, you know, there, there's, there's not that many good examples of people who've made large amounts of money on licensing. Rambus is the, the best, and of course, people, many people know Rambus got in trouble. So I think, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's kind of a, a, a pessimistic statement, but it, it seems like, uh, um, you know, there, there was a bubble, a lot of funding came, that bubble's gone, uh, and, you know, the funding propelled us forward, but, you know, it's just going to be back to kind of the org organic exponential long-term growth, which will eventually get us to where we're going, but it's, I think we're on fundamentally that curve, and, and we can't, we can't out-accelerate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, my name is Alexi Andreev. I'm with Harris & Harris Group. We are one of the VCs specializing in the area. We've been around since 1982, but since 2001, every single we did was in tiny tech, as we defined, which is a uh, collection of nanotechnology companies, some MEMS companies, and some advanced material companies, but predominantly nanotechnology. Uh, we tend to do uh, Series A and early stage investments, although we can go uh, all the way to Series B and Series C. We have 32 portfolio companies. Again, every single one is enabled by novel material and nanoscale 
uh, features and properties, headquartered in New York City, office in Palo Alto. Uh, if you look at our portfolio today, and I will talk a little bit more about evolution of nanotechnology and how it changed over the last five or six years, we have roughly 40% in clean tech. Uh, we have roughly 20% of life sciences. We have roughly 20% in next generation uh, semiconductor in optical components, and we have uh, remaining 20% of some esoteric stuff from semiconductor equipment to quantum computers. So if you're looking at the problems and what are the challenges, I think uh, the biggest challenge which we as venture capitalists uh, underestimated and, and it was the biggest miss uh, when, when the technology got the buzzword was the very limited uh, manufacturing and scaling infrastructure. And so the, 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 the nature of the more slow, you can slice and dice it differently, and I'm sure there are different explanations, but essentially you're using uh, 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 equipment to build a better equipment to build even better equipment, or use processors to design new processors. You write equation, you will get exponential curve uh, uh, as a solution of this equation. It is not happening with uh, nanotechnology yet. So if historically, you can start from phones to TV sets to fax machines. So it took almost 100 years to get to 1 million phone penetration. And then it took half of the time, even less, for 100, for 1 million phone, uh, TV sets and then color. So every time you're introducing new groundbreaking product, the time to get to 1 million uh, threshold shrinks. With iPhone, I think it took less than a week to get the first million units in the hands of the customers. And it all relies on the existing manufacturing capability. It is, it is hard to believe what is available today in Pacific Rim countries and, and in the United States and Europe. If you want to make something physical, you can scale from zero to million a week units in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Nanotechnology, by, uh, by the virtue, by being very different, very innovative, very orthogonal, we're trying to introduce new properties, we're trying to hijack some nanoscale uh, physical phenomena. Uh, uh, in most cases, you cannot use existing manufacturing infrastructure to transition from R&D samples to prototyping samples to engineering samples to volume manufactured devices. And, and what we figured out is the initial hope was we can create the companies, put a lot of IP in those companies, and, and essentially do biotech model where you will secure IP rights, you will demonstrate uh, 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 some early results, and then it will be enough to bring even more capital and then essentially offload the company to, to, to the public markets, and, and, and some of them will, will build big factories, some of them will uh, shut down. But essentially, the idea was you can build something large and valuable based on IP. I think this illusion does not exist anymore. I think every single company is building a product, at least uh, in our portfolio. Every one out of 32 is building something. Whether it's drugs, it's slightly different. But at least on the physical sciences, there are either tools or memory chips or sensors. And then Tero, uh, uh, mentioned by Anthony, and Nanomix is also our portfolio company. Uh, and, 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 and we should probably uh, expect it, and we didn't. So you need to develop R&D sample, and labs are great on, on doing that. And then you're getting money, and you're transitioning from R&D uh, samples to some pilot samples, which look okay. And then you have to go and raise a lot of capital and be ready to wait for a long period of time to build your own fab. And every single company today which is trying to do it, they have their own unique fab. You cannot fully rely on the experience of your predecessors. You have to invent many manufacturing steps and many uh, process steps on your own. You have to fight with yields. You have to fight with reliability. You have to get the cost down to the reasonable numbers because otherwise it's just a slightly better mousetrap. No one cares whether it's nanotechnology or not. Everyone cares about an application and product and how well it competes with existing alternative non-nanotechnology solutions. And so this lack of scalability infrastructure, I think, is the biggest uh, 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 impediment to what is going on in nanotechnology. Another thing, and it's the last comment, I think it is hard to extract value. 
it's not hard to create value for nanotechnology companies. It is hard to extract value. And speaking about sensors, yes, sensors is a, is a very interesting area. Yes, you can sense things. You can uh, 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 introduce them in a very pervasive way. The problem is no one is willing to pay for the sensors. And so the question, do you want to, if, if you're starting a company, a nanotechnology company, or if you're a large company, if you want to compete on the material side and kind of sitting low in the value chain, you're competing with DuPonts and Dow's and BSFs and Cornings of the world, which have hundreds and hundreds of years of history, enormous manufacturing plants, and it's just pretty much impossible to be them on scale. They will over-design and over-produce you and over-sell and over-ship. You go up to the component space and, and, and you have to build your own fab and it's 100 million plus exercise, no matter how you slice and dice it or list in, in hundreds of millions. Or you want to go even further and build the entire system on your own and then we're talking about substantially uh, uh, larger capital commitments as well as, uh, I, I'm sure we all know here, as complexity of the system goes up the probability of failure goes down, not linearly, but, but at least as a square, polynomially. And, and you're transitioning from relatively simple quantum uh, or nanotechnology structures on a material level to component level to system level. You need more capital, you need more time, and the probability of technical failure goes up substantially. So it's not the easiest place to invest, and I think that's the reason why you have a lot of people still doing uh, web 2.0 deals where you're fighting with engineers and you're not fighting with mother nature Which sometimes does not want to cooperate no matter what you do and 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 on the same time uh, I, I think there is a group of uh, uh, Very focused VCs today including Airhead including Harrison Harris and a couple of other firms Which feel pretty comfortable and they they, they have eyes open on, on what's going on and what it takes to build a successful non-technology company. But there are some very significant non-technology companies around already selling the products, scamming revenues, there are even some profitable non-technology companies. So it is coming there. It just takes more time and more money than everyone expected seven years ago. Thank you. Welcome to the Nano Lamentations panel. Um, you know, I, I suspect one of the reasons that and there is, in fact, a nanotechnology panel associated with the Singularity Summit, is that there is a classic vision of nanotech as this um, radical technology, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Ur vision of the Drexler uh, nanomachines. Uh, since, long since deprecated, but still there's this sense that nanotechnology means something almost magical. That isn't really coming across from the discussions here, and that, that's fine. We're talking about, here we are talking about things that are much more prosaic. Um, so the question, in part from the, uh, from the Twitter stream, but also just you know, what I'm wondering, are, you know, what breakthroughs really are, you know, are there any breakthroughs imminent? Or is the vision of radical nanotechnology comatose? Is this something that is perpetually 25 years away? You know, it's you know right right with nu nuclear fusion. You know, it's kind of a, a Zeno's paradox of technology. But please. Well, you know, I um, I think you know it's just you know when I, I started working in the area of nanotech, you know, you kind of look at these you know different grades of things, and you, you think back to the semiconductor world. Think of, it's an, if it's analogous to that, right? So first you'd have people build devices, and then this is what Christine is saying uh, in the area of sensors, right? A sensor is equivalent typically to a single transistor. And so you, you know, you gotta build that first before you can you know, build larger, you know, large complicated systems. And so I think, you know, the, so the, the, get back to Alexia was saying, I mean, people initially had this ex, you know, excitement that we'll have you know, big complicated systems, you know, the nanobots swimming around, the, you know, that whole thing, uh, repairing, a, uh, um, but it's just, you, you have to be able to make uh, single devices out of a new technology. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we're at. And, and even making single devices, it takes, as, as Alexi was saying, it takes 
a big effort to, to scale those up. So right. even, even things where you just take a single device and try to scale to, like in the case of a memory or a display, uh, you know, to, I mean, another case study is this company, um, Candescent, which is not really nano, it was mic uh, micro, but it was uh, these uh, new kind of flat panel displays called field emitters. And I think Candescent still holds the record for the largest amount of mo VC money raised before it failed, something like <laughs> 700, I think $700 million. And I, I spoke with uh, the CTO of that company whose father invented the technology it was based upon. And I, you know, we were talking about, well, what went wrong? And it just, basically, they had, they had to, to reinvent the semiconductor manufacturing you know, fab, which was, you know, 50% they could reuse, but 50% they had to reinvent. And it's just horrifically expensive. So, uh, you know, making a, a, making a single nano device, you know, in a, in a sensor like the Nomix does, I think you could you can envision happening and functionalizing. Trying to take that single thing and replicating it, you know, a, you know, a thousand by a thousand, that becomes much more difficult. And, and trying to do something like what, you know, an, an Intel Pentium type thing based on new technology, that's, you know. Okay, so basically what, what you're saying is just it ended up being a lot harder than anyone expected. Christine, jump in there. Yeah, I think you, you had asked us, is it, you know, are we on the edge of a breakthrough or is it comatose? I think the answer probably as well, there's another pathway, which is, I think this seems to be incremental. Um, and for those of you who track this space, um, uh, it's every, you know, every weekday on our blog, we post what we think is the coolest thing of the day. And, you know, there's something every day, um, whether it's chemical, biological, physics-based. Um, recently, we posted that um, DARPA is funding Zyvex to do tip-based nanofabrication. So, so that's atomically precise construction. Um, if you look at, if you want breakthroughs, I would say look at the Feynman Prizes. See what those folks are doing. That's generally at the research level. It's not a product yet, but um, extremely impressive work. So, but I think there's no question. This is hard. This is just really hard. And you know, if I wanted to make easy money, I would go work at LinkedIn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I would add one more thing. I think that. Yeah, that I think that the chatter uh, uh, about breakthroughs and about incremental uh, steps just follow the market. You know, when there was a lot of froth in this market, uh, we could afford to talk about, about these great breakthroughs and change in the world. And now, the market as it is now, uh, no one's paying for optionality. No one is paying for something that may mature five years from now, ten years from now, uh, and change the world. It doesn't mean that we're not focusing on that, because we're all in this business because we think that, that, that uh, that there's an awful lot of technologies that will change the world, and, and, and uh, those are being pursued. But I think that, that, that when venture capital firms, when publicly traded companies are talking about, about their portfolios and about what they're doing, uh, you know, they're talking about, about really you know, more near-term applications. You know, what can I get into market in the next couple of quarters, and how is that going to make, uh, how is that going to, uh, to make an economic uh, effect on my business? Um, uh, and, and I think that's just sort of part of the maturation also of this, of this movement. Um, it's very easy to talk about world-changing things, um, but once you get into it and once you start to, to, uh, to play in the business, uh, I think that you, you, uh, you've got the same constraints as, any, as, as everybody else in the market, which is, which is uh, uh, producing something that, that can get to market in the, in the, in the nearer term. Thanks. Um, so one last, one last question for the panel here before we go to, the, to audience questions, and that is, uh, quickly, what would you say is the you know, the coolest thing that you think is, you know, there is actually quite imminent. You know, actually, let me start from that end. Alexi. Okay. It's like you have 32 portfolio companies, which one is your child is your favorite. And so I, I'm sure everyone has favorite things. Uh, on the short time horizon, we're talking about three to five to 10 years. Right. We are not talking about the swarms of nano machines, which no one knows how to build and, and most importantly, uh, mass produce. I, I, I think printable electronics is going to be a very big way. And so the novel manufacturing paradigm where you're using uh, uh, inks and ink-based uh, uh, silicon inks or uh, gallium arsenide inks or whatever inks, and you're switching from very, very expensive uh, manufacturing process and conventional fabs to the printable electronics, uh, both displays uh, logic, transistors, 
uh, photovoltaics and other solid state systems you can manufacture at substantially lower cost and make them pretty much disposable. And nanotechnology is a huge enabler of, of, of the wave which is coming today and, and uh, you can go and check out IBF uh, or IDC uh, printable electronics conferences. The, the presentations you will hear are totally outlined there. So pervasive computing, pervasive low cost uh, smart devices communicating with the rest of the world kind of swarms of things. Uh, uh, they are not nano in size, but they are deeply enabled by nanotechnology. Another thing which I'm personally very excited is the life science developments and ability to uh, uh, identify the cancers as you're making surgery and ability to say, you know, whenever a surgeon operates on a brain cancer, for example, every micron of extra brain tissues the surgeon is taking is sometimes it's, it's, it's the difference between full recovery or somebody who will not be able to talk, walk, and even think for the rest of their life. And so today the process is extremely, and not only brain, brain is an extreme case, but essentially you want to cut as, 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 as little as you can. But you cannot identify when you're doing surgery where you have uh, tumor tissue and where you have healthy tissues. And so there is a lot of things going on where you can, first of all, identify in real time what kind of tissues you're cutting off. And second, uh, there are better tools to cut and third, there are non-invasive tools which can attack cancer tissues or facilitate recovery of patients at different stages. And so I think this, this life science applications, they're already today, they're already in phase one, phase two, and some of them are in phase three studies. And the printable electronics, uh, uh, my portfolio company, Covio, they announced last week they launched a fab. They print RFID tags using uh, silicon inks here in the Ampidus. I think it's one of the first or one of the few new semiconductor fabs started in this country in the last 10, 15 years. And so it is happening. It is enabled by nanotechnology, but we as users will see end products. And, and as, as it happened with IT, everyone is using IT nowadays, and, and you go to uh, uh, Walmart annual report, they're not talking about IT systems they're using. Thank so the same will happen in, <laughs> with, with nanotechnology. It will be enabled by nanotechnology, but people will stop saying it's enabled by nanotechnology. It will be pervasive, and it's always pervasive in certain areas. Thank you. N never ask a VC to choose between his children. <laughs> Anthony. Well, um, I think, uh, um, is it, I guess if I, if I look at what I think is uh, Im an imminent technology, um, uh, you know, I, I focus a lot on, on the uh, emerging memory companies, and there's been a lot of excitement about, about MRAM, and um, I mean, it's not as uh, you know, sexy as some of the things on, 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 uh, Alexei has been talking about, but uh, um, it, it seems like it's, there's a very good chance of that happening. There's always, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, all the challenges of bringing up new, these new kinds of things, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of people and a lot of money and uh, momentum building within this area. And what's exciting about it is that it's, a, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a universal memory. It combines the, the, the best aspects of a number of existing memories, both uh, DRAM and flash. And so you could imagine you know, having you know, uh, gigabytes of memory. Um, that's not just, uh, that, that's, a high, that's a high speed memory, so it acts as a, as a, as a nice unifier. It seems like you know, there's, there's really a lot of, a lot of progress and, and, uh, in this area, and as I said, there's venture capital money flowing into it, and uh, so startups that are really going quickly. Uh, one's called Grandis here in the Bay Area, and you know, big companies are also uh, um, pouring a lot of money. So I think uh, that could be uh, very impactful in a relatively short term. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna stick with the detection, imaging, and treatment of cancer. Um, Cancer affects everyone. If you live long enough, you will get cancer. Um, and the dramatic advances that I'm seeing are just very inspirational. And I think that's going to help the field a lot in terms of its image. Because um, if, you can, if you can have a dramatic medical advance based on your technology, people are going to cut you a lot of slack. Yeah. And we may need that, by the way. Well, we, yeah. we need the slack later on. One of the nanoparticle-based cancer treatments I saw had a 100% success rate. Yeah, I saw the phrase complete tumor remission in one treatment. Now yeah. that's what you want to hear. 
Uh, some of you are old enough to remember when the war on cancer was declared. That was a long time ago now, and we just have not made enough progress. But we're, I th I've got my hopes up on this one. Yeah. Yeah, I find that as I get older, I, I, I think that, that uh, increases in health care are, are, are cooler than increases in uh, MRAM and such. Um, so, so, my, so I have two things. Um, um, one is RNAi or RNA interference. I think that's very cool. You know, once we can really harness that, this is, it's a way of silencing or turning down target genes. Uh, once we can do that, we really have a, a, a potent and revolutionary tool for pharmaceuticals to, to turn down specific genes that are involved in, in disease states. Uh, it is world changing. Uh, the problem there is getting this RNAi or this siRNA or short interfering RNA molecules into cells, uh, and that will likely depend upon nanotechnology. We have a company that that uh, is in clinical trials right now doing that, but, but I think that, that, that it will require nanotech to, uh, to bring that to, uh, to the marketplace. The second thing, which is, which is more specific, um, is, uh, and, and, and I apologize for, for, uh, for uh, pushing one of our own companies, but we have a company called Nanotope that, uh, that at least in animals, uh, can cure paralysis associated with spinal cord injury, and that's cool. It's not, you know, is it a huge market? No, but it is, but it is, uh, it is a neat thing if you could make people walk again. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have, we have some time for questions from the audience. Um, we'll, there are microphones floating around, so raise your hands. Put your hands in the air. I've got the microphone. Who has a Wave question? them like you don't care. Hi there, this is a question for the whole panel. A couple of years back, we, uh, we heard about China funding nanotech and Europe funding nanotech, and America kind of chipped in and put millions and millions of dollars into it. Now, my question is, did you guys see any of that? Where did that go? Yeah, I think we saw a lot of that, actually. I, th I think that, that probably many of Alexi's companies, maybe all of them, are the result of, of, uh, of university uh, derived technology, and that, was, and, and that is there solely because of government funding of nanotechnology as well as biotechnology and, 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 other, and other things. As I, as I mentioned earlier, um, private industry can't afford to fund basic technology, basic science, uh, basic research. Um, um, so it is, a, it is a clear partnership, and, and, and we have, you know, we are, we, we've always led the way uh, when we, we continue to lead the way. You know, the big innovations are still happening in the United States. Now, um, that has, our, 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 uh, our big lead there has diminished a bit, but we're still out front. Uh, so you guys are being a little more realistic about things. How does that work on the bad side as well as to the good side? Because the, the people are, who are more of the dreamers, they kind of think both ways but big. So is it hard to, you know, destroy the world with nanobots? Is it harder than, is it harder than the other side, the singularity side? I don't understand the question. Well, you say that nanotechnology is hard. Is it hard to do bad as well as good? It's hard, no matter what you're trying to do, it's just hard. It's, it's okay. technically hard. It's hard to get molecules to do what you want them to do. So, so is your question, uh, if it's so hard to get, to get good things to market, is it also hard to have unintended consequences? Or okay. intended It's hard terrorist. to build things that do bad stuff, too, for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you'll get the unintended consequences whether you want them or not. But the, uh, uh, no, I think if you want to do bad stuff, you're probably better off with bio. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 <laughs> yeah. We, we, we didn't see any 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 technologies on the horizon where you can have a runaway nanosystem, and the uh, the self assembly doesn't work. It it works in us, and we are all self assembled, and it's a miracle. And when you're trying to apply the self assembly to the products, the yields are terrible. They're not repeatable. Uh, it just we we don't understand so many things that it's very unlikely we can create something out of the blue which will run away and destroy the world, at least that's, that's the current state of art. It's much easier to go virus uh, uh, modifications and all the bacteria stuff, so nothing yet. Of course, I'm, I'm let me just, a... one, one, I got to wrap up on one thing, which is, of course, the software, which we were saying is easier, can help make nanotechnology easier by doing really good design work. So you can get leverage that way to do whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. You can use the easier stuff to get leverage on the hard stuff. I'm a bit of an anomaly at this conference, but I'm a physician. I'm curious how far away from market some of these medical things are and specifically what some of the more 
important applications in terms of medicine are that you're working on? Um, um, so we, so Arrowhead has a, has a few subsidiaries that are that are in healthcare. Um, one I mentioned, or two I mentioned. Uh, one, the RNAi uh, idea. Um, we have a company called Colando Pharmaceuticals that is that is delivering uh, siRNA uh, for for cancer therapeutics. Um, that same company also is delivering small molecules for cancer therapeutics. Uh, it's very near. We are we are in phase one clinical trials on the siRNA side. Uh, we're the only company. Um, to be actively delivering siRNA in humans. We're the only company using siRNA for cancer. Um, uh, on the small molecule side, we are in phase two clinical trials for ovarian cancer, and so it's, it's, we think it's quite near. On the, on the nanotope side, the, the other company I mentioned for the spinal cord, we think will be in humans uh, in 2009 with that company. Um, um, so. Yeah, we have a company, Biovex. They very successfully completed uh, phase two uh, studies on melanoma treatment, and, and you can go and check out the, 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 the websites. They, they posted all the information. Multiple uh, finishing phase one, entering phase two. So it's all in FDA hands, and, and some whenever those products hit the market, but again, it's not early R&D. It's phase one, phase two, and certain things maybe entering phase three within a reasonable period of time. It's interesting that the the uh, myth of nanotechnology has long been around um, productivity and abundance. And it, it seems to be turning out that the real um, fundamental breakthroughs are less about material goods and much more about um, finally dealing with some of the, the legendary ailments that afflict us. You know, cancer and paralysis are probably two of the, you know, the biological insults that most affect us, you know, socially and psychologically. And uh, it's really, it's really heartening to hear about some of these, you know, imminent, imminent developments. Any other questions out there? Yeah, to, uh, not to put a damper on the very exciting near-term stuff, but um, looking out 10, 15 years, maybe 20, um, what do you see as being the, maybe, um, advances outside of the vertical of nanotechnology that will maybe um, provide the opportunity to, to have these sort of more fantastical paradigm shifting technologies, not, not again to demean the uh, remarkable stuff that you're talking about now, especially in the medical field. <laughs> well, you're the futurist. I know. Well, Christine, you... <laughs> Uh, what the, the further the, the stuff that's further out and perhaps outside of the the box of of you know, incremental particulate development? Well, I still expect to see molecular machine systems. I think that will happen. I think non biological molecular machine systems will happen, and they will be atomically precise. How long that's going to take, I don't know. It, you know, it's really hard to do. On the other hand, we have the leverage from the software world. So, if we can find ways to exploit that. Um, which I think we probably can eventually, um, that, could, that could move things along much faster. So, you know, you, we can call it a myth. I don't know if it's a myth or not. I guess it's, to, you know, if, does it exist today? No, today it's not, in, not happening. But um, I, I expect to see these things in my lifetime, uh, assuming that I uh, take care of myself and take advantage of the anti-cancer treatments. And all of the pills uh, like Ray Kurzweil. And all of those pills, like Ray? Take, yeah, <laughs> got to make sure. You know, I, Ray takes so many pills, I don't know if he has room for food, does he? <laughs> yeah, uh, I live in Southern California, and so, and so just to take two examples of two things that would, that would transform Southern California it's, is, uh, is water and uh, emission-free vehicles. Uh, you know, you think, at least in that area, how, how those two issues uh, you know, radically affect the way we live our lives and, the way, and, and, and whether or not people want to live in this area. Um, I think that, that emission-free vehicles are, are, uh, are going to happen and going to happen in, in, in not the near term, but in the midterm. Uh, and and, uh, and desalinization uh, is, is going to happen at some point once we can figure out how to do this in, a, in, a, uh, in an energy efficient manner. It's going to happen, in, in not in, in the near term, but probably in the midterm, and that's going to revolutionize um, at least the way Southern California lives its life and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, other areas as well. The, the interesting thing to think about is you know, not just what are, the, what are the myriad applications of a more advanced nanotechnology, but also what are the kinds of external developments that will shape 
the emergence of a you know, more sophisticated you know, manufacturing-oriented nanotech. Uh, there are three things that I think are going to be critical over that 10 to 15 year time period. Uh, the first is, as, as Christine said, software. You know, the development of good uh, design, uh, design software will be um, fundamental to, to, uh, a fundamental difference between a sluggish and uh, imprecise you know, development path and a really powerful and you know, wide-ranging wide uh, development path. The second is synthetic biology. You know, not because you're going to see a direct line from synthetic biology to nanotech, but because a lot of the lessons we learn around operating at that level with, you know, with essentially you know, bio-legos uh, will inform the developments in, uh, in the nanospace. And related to that, or parallel to that, would be uh, advances in um, macro-scale and micro-scale fabrication technologies, you know, desktop print, uh, 3D printers and the like. Um, b again, because of, you know, not that there's a direct development path, but because of the lessons that we would learn, not just in terms of design software, not just in terms of um, what do people want, but in terms of what are the, the legal and liability issues? What are the intellectual property issues? What are the kinds of things that not just people want, but people are afraid of? Because whatever people are afraid of with fabbers, they're going to be 10 times more afraid of with, uh, with nano. I, I would add one more thing which may enable nanotechnology and be the, the, the big thing 10 to 15 years from now, or 15 plus. We should definitely keep in mind uh, that quantum computers might be possible. And so today, whenever you're modeling all the physical systems, you can write all the beautiful like, Schrodinger equations, but they're way too difficult to solve. And so if you can solve them precisely, you can model how drugs interact with enzymes and molecules and how it's all physical processes. You can write equations, you cannot solve them. And so the quantum computer is both enabled by nanotechnology and, and, and in circle contributing to the next generation of nanotechnology might be very, very critical piece of futuristic invention. Uh, we can see 10 to 15 years from now, maybe sooner. Let me, let, me, let me build upon that. I, I, that. That's certainly true. Coming from the, the, the you know, spending the last year trying to, uh, to sell, you know, quantum simulation software, one of the big concerns is that, you know, even with a big a cluster of machines, we can only simulate systems below a thousand atoms, which is uh, pretty limiting to many people's applications. Um, but, but, you know, back to your comment that, that software is an enabling technology, um, I, I can respond to this with, with, with great authority because I, I've been both in the you know, atomic simulation space and prior to that in the, in the chip design software space, you know, the, what's called EDA, which is the, the software that people use to design you know, all the integrated circuits. And, and you know, ED, EDA uh, is, you know, there's like $12 billion is, is the market cap of all, the, all the, the four big companies, at least it was as of a couple months ago. And I probably divide that by, I don't know, 50% or something now. Uh, or more, um, but um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was in that space and I, I, I kind of you know left that space and started working in nano, I, I asked the question: Well, why doesn't such an why doesn't this large software infrastructure exist in the world of nano, or for that matter, even MEMS? Right, because MEMS are kind of like integrated circuits. And what I what, after looking at it for a while, I realized it's just you know, there's this huge infrastructure in the chip world at every every single point, and there's a large number of, of new designs coming in, going all the way, and, and chips coming out the other end. At least that's the way it was, um, and and that has enabled this entire uh, uh, supply chain to come into existence because there's enough money to every point. The problem um, with with software for at the at the that does simulation at the atomic level is that. You know, there, how many people are designing new semiconductor processes? Because these guys can use that software. Well, the, there's Intel and there's a few others, but that number is small and it's getting smaller all the time. Now, AMD is out of this out of this business, uh, although they they, they, they created a, a foundry, so presumably the the, the, uh, <laughs> the net was zero. But but it's just fewer and fewer people. So as the customer as the number of customers shrink down, and when you're talking about simulating nano, you're talking about you know designing a manufacturing process. And, and so there's just not that many people need, there's just aren't that many of those being designed and therefore there's not many seats of software being sold and therefore there's not that attractive for people to enter into. So I, I think this is really a, you know, a, a limiting factor. If you look at all the molecular level simulation companies, the biggest one is Acelerus and you know, their market value is, I don't know what it is, 100 something million. Let's talk about revenues. Who knows what the market value in today's market is. Yeah. I, I think they're 20 to $50 million company. In, in revenues, in annual revenues. Okay. Yeah. 
Of course, the wild card in all of that is the emergence of uh, if, if there's any kind of work in an open source, in, in the or open source model as opposed to strictly the, the, the profit driven driven model. I mean, there's, I think we're we'll, we'll seeing but, parallel development. But you know, you know, the thing is that there, there's a huge amount of open source in this area in the sense that uh, there's, 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 there's a gazillion of these little codes out there that have been written by academics and they're all totally unusable. As, as, as one, well, no, seriously, there's, as one, you know, we, we were trying to sell to the big defense contractor and they had his, you know, his PhD who had written one of these things. And he said, well, look at nobody gets a, no one gets a, a, a PhD for writing a GUI, a graphical user interface. And so you've got lots and lots of codes out there and they're just, you know, and, and all the commercial ones come from, come, do come from academia. Um, but it's just, you know, the, the usability of them is, is really tough, you know, outside of the guy who actually wrote it. So, I don't know, th these are kind of the problems I see, you know, if you want the, the nitty gritty from the trenches of, you know, that, the software enabling it. These, these are some of, the, some of the economic factors I see. Jonas, we have time for any more questions? Uh, I think we're wrapped up. Okay, well, thanks a lot, folks, and uh, thank you for your time.